Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. This week's entrepreneur has been building to this moment for a couple of years now, a five-part celebration for Hispanic Heritage Month. What is Hispanic Heritage Month? Why is it important? And why should an entrepreneur care? Hispanic Heritage Month observations started in the United States in the 1968 under President Lyndon Johnson and expanded under President Ronald Reagan in 1988 to cover the span of September 15th through October 15th, which it became law August 17th, 1988. September 15th is unique because it is the anniversary of Independence Day for Latin American countries Costa Rica, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Mexico, Chile, and Belize celebrate their Independence Day the following day. September 15th, 18th, and 21, respectively. The Hispanic Latino reported population in 2020 was 62.1 million, which includes people of any race, and that is why Hispanic heritage is important. Without getting into too much detail, race describes physical traits and ethnicity refers to cultural identification. Hispanics are diverse. Most people think of the white and light-skinned Hispanics, but forget about the Asian, black, and indigenous Latinos. New American Economy Research Fund found Hispanic households earned more than $1.2 trillion and paid almost $309 billion in taxes in 2019. The 62 million Hispanics in the United States made up 18.7% of the entire United States population, making them the largest ethnic group in the country. Some states, including South Dakota and Vermont, saw population growth within their Hispanic community grow by 67% or more between 2010 and 2020. In North Dakota, the Hispanic population increased an astonishing 148.1% from that same time period. Now, those alarmed by immigration allow me to point out that more than 90% of the growth in the Hispanic population between 2010 and 2019 were among U.S.-born Hispanics. As I mentioned, the Hispanic household earned more than $1.2 trillion, which turned into $910 billion in spending power. That's money still held after the $308.5 billion in taxes paid. According to the New American Economy Report, the economic contributions of Hispanic Americans, Hispanic immigrants are significantly more likely to be entrepreneurs than the general U.S. population. During a time where most industries in the U.S. are experiencing staffing shortage, the Hispanic workers account for 3 in 10 workers in the agriculture and construction industries and 1 in 4 workers in the hospitality and food service industries nationwide, and that is why the entrepreneur should care. More than 12% of the Hispanic immigrant workers work through their own businesses in 2019, accounting for more than 2.5 million Hispanic entrepreneurs in the United States. Yet Hispanic Americans make just 73 cents for every dollar earned by white Americans. Research concludes that to be collectively 288 billion in underpaid Hispanics annually. Hispanics should be generating an additional $2.3 trillion in total revenue annually and 735,000 new businesses supporting 6.6 million new jobs, if not for major disparities between Latino and white-owned businesses, according to McKinsey and Company, the economy stat for Latino Americans, the American dream deferred. By 2060, Hispanics may account for 30% of the entire labor force. Hispanics will continue to become more integrated into the U.S. economy. Hispanic heritage is more than just Taco Tuesday or mixing margaritas. It's about recognizing the diversity of the Hispanic race, acknowledging their contributions to our community and economy, and welcoming and embracing their culture as they have embraced the American culture. Knowledge is power. As Mariah Orr so elegantly put it, cultural awareness necessitates respect and in turn of coming together to celebrate our diverse backgrounds. All Americans, not only Hispanics or Latinos, owe respect to the Hispanic Latino heritage. For roughly 30 days, we welcome everyone to celebrate Hispanic heritage. Ask about the culture, the food, the language. I encourage you to find inspiration within each other. After all, no matter our race, religion, pigment, or sexual orientation, we are all entrepreneurs, a community of global entrepreneurs. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. My next guest is an experienced shoe designer. 
designer and skilled storyteller with color and materials, a graduate of Penn Soul Academy, and with a passion for community, he is the founder and creative director of Juntos PDX. Please welcome Christian Vargas. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Cristian Vargas. What's going on, dude? How you doing, Gabriel? I'm Thanks. excited because uh, we are we have a lot to talk about. We've been doing a lot of work already. But before we get into that, let's introduce who is Cristian. Oh, man, there's a lot of places to start, but uh, <laughs> if we, you know, just break down the roots, I'm originally from Mexico City. My mom migrated here in 1998, and I've been here in the U.S. since then. Um, what I do is, um, Christian is for me personally, I'm a footwear designer, more specifically color material designer. I've been in the industry for the last five years. And now I've taken a new endeavor and a new venture, and that's where I'm at today. So before we get into the new venture, let's 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 talk about the shoe designing. How did you get into shoe designing? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, just to keep this long story short, it just honestly started back in high school. A lot of the kids in high school wanted to stand out, wanted to be authentic and unique. So I grabbed a lot of inspiration from a lot of my classmates. Um, and specifically, there was three kids in high school who were shoe collectors. And from there, you just kind of just, I thought about, well, what, what does that really mean? What is that? So I started talking to them and then just kind of got more insights on what shoes are. And in 2006, that's when the hobby started. But um, design, that was just for the hobby of footwear. But when we get deeper into design, it started after I graduated high school. Um, you know, I have, I have a 15 year old daughter. So once my daughter was born in 2007, I was actually a freshman, sophomore, junior, junior going to be a senior when I had my kids. So then I just kind of had, had to honestly just start thinking about career paths that I wanted to do. And it wasn't until three years after I graduated high school where I found out about this footwear academy called pencil academy. Oh yeah. Yep. And, um, Dwayne Edwards. Yeah, uh, Dwayne Edwards. Yeah, Dwayne Edwards is the one that, you know, opened up the, the opportunity for me. Uh, it took me four years, honestly, to get in. Um, it was just a lot of rejections at first. But after that, it just kind of started off from reje getting rejected and just kind of seeing why I'm getting rejected. And the reason why I was getting rejected was because I was coming at design more of an artistic perspective as opposed to a problem solving. So... It was, I also have a sister who has cerebral palsy and she's not able to walk. Uh, she's always going to be in a wheelchair, but I felt the need of creating something for her to problem solve for that specific category of uh, footwear, you know, something that a lot of footwear industries don't dive into really deep. And so I ended up um, just creating a, a shoe for my sister that just pretty much connects um disability, the disability area, and then also into the footwear area. So I created a shoe that it's, it's interesting though, because now that I'm thinking about it, I'm imagining how I did it, but it's just, uh, it started off with the brace and I honestly just tapped into how can I create a footwear, uh, a shoe, I'm sorry, a shoe that goes along with, um, you know, plastic braces for kids that can't walk or are learning how to walk. So I ended up uh, finding a way to uh, put those together, mold them, and then ended up presenting that as one of my presentations uh, for Pencil. And right there and then, that's when Dwayne kind of just smiled at, the, uh, <laughs> at my submission and said, you know what, like for the last couple of years, like I've seen you grown just through your submissions and, you know, maybe you do have the opportunity to, uh, you know, continue to invest and in, not invest, but uh, learn more about your process of design. So that wasn't a yes or a no. So I was like, hey, just tell me if I'm going to, you know, get accepted to one of your classes. I've been applying for so long now. And it wasn't until 2017 when I was working at a nonprofit full time and I applied for a class and I got the acceptance letter. And I, you know, I got emotional. I cried because it took me four years to get yeah. in. But uh, as soon as I got that, um, I needed to do a footwear um, 
summer class and that's what I got uh, accepted for. So I ended up just leaving my full-time job. Uh, and to remind you at the time I was still living with my parents and I still, you know, have a kid to take care of. So I needed to find a way to, uh, supplement the, um, you know, just the money to help me pay for some bills here and there. But luckily I have a supportive family and, uh, I was able to leave my full-time job to follow my passion and that opened up the doors to find out more about what it is to be a footwear designer. That's where I found out about color material design, which was awesome. I got more attached to that. I got more connected with that. I like telling stories and I think it has to do with me being also a uh, Mexicano, Latino, because we like to tell stories. Yeah. So I think that's where me personally, I kind of just dived in deeper into color materials and, and it's kind of just, I, didn't, I wouldn't say I, I just left footwear on the, on the back burner, but I just footwear design because there's two specific fields. So let me just go ahead and just kind of just give yes, you like please. a brief. Yes. So footwear design and color material design, they're in the same umbrella. The difference is that they all have their own specific pillars. So you have a footwear designer that's designing the shoe, that's creating uh, all the processes from the molding to the upper to the whole, the whole DNA of it. Then once they finish creating it, they pass it on to us as color material designers to tell a story visually so that consumer can grasp on that product and learn more about it through just visual color and then the touch. So I ended up leaving, like I said, just the footwear DNA aspect of it behind me and then ended up investing more on the other pillar, which is colored materials. But yeah, man, after that, like uh, in 2018, I mean, a year, yeah, not even a year, six months after I really like, it's so crazy to even say this, like I'm getting chills right now talking about it <laughs> because uh, after, you know, I left my full-time job, I did a, uh, a summer class and then they accepted me to do an internship, a three month internship uh, class. And from there, it was just like, just one thing after the other, just bam, bam, bam. I mean, it opened up a lot of doors. I wasn't even ready for them, but I knew what I wanted to do. So after I left pencil in December of, uh, December 30, actually December 19, we presented a project to this big brands. And, um, after that, like it just opened up the door to start working at Keen. Like, it's so crazy because it was, I think it was a, a new year's gift from one of my mentors, uh, Suseth. shout out to Suseth. Uh, she just reached out and said, Hey, you know, January 1st came around. I remember the text. She said, Hey, um, it's been a couple of weeks. Uh, do you have time to work at Keen as a contract for color material? I'm like what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, yeah. If you think I'm ready, she's like, okay, cool. I'm going to put you in contact with them. And man, like two weeks after that, the text message, I got a job as a contract designer at Keen Footwear. That was my first time ever designing anything footwear related. And after that, it just opened up the doors to other other brands. And um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much how it started. So just me being a designer started with me uh, getting being inspired by my daughter, but then also being inspired by my sister and uh, creating product that solves problems. So would you consider yourself, cause you're, you're kind of now transitioning. You mentioned your, 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 are you still considered yourself as a shoe designer or a footwear designer? Yeah. I mean, I, that's a great question. I do. I honestly do. Um, I'm a designer at heart. Um, but right now I'm just, uh, taking kind of like a sabbatical of a personal sabbatical of absence of designing just to invest on this project that I'm working on that I feel passionate for. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about this project. All right. Let's talk about Juntos. What, what is it? What is the project and why, why is it that you're so passionate about it? You're taking a sabbatical to do it. Awesome. Um, I'll say this, like it's, when I'm with the employers that I used to work with, uh, when I start, when I started, uh, they didn't have any representation for Latinos. Uh, they had different diversity groups, but when I started, I didn't feel part of a community. I didn't feel welcome. So what I did is uh, one of my colleagues and I, um, had a similar idea. So I started working at this employer. Um, I put in my first 90 days and I did what I needed to do. But in the back of my mind, it was always like, how can I, make myself feel welcome. And luckily there was at least uh, three with me was four Latinos in the design team, which I felt welcome. But at the same time, it wasn't enough um, diversity for my people, right? So I kind of just wanted to create something. I don't know what it was, but then it's crazy though, because when timing, you know, when timing happens, a lot of great things come uh, just naturally. And so one of my 
coworkers, I uh, ended up having a similar idea of creating a diversity group. We didn't know how, but I remember we connected and we just had conversations about how she's from Spain and then she got uh, relocated to the United States here in Portland, Oregon, and she didn't feel welcome. So her speaking Spanish and being from Spain, me being a uh, Mexicano and speaking Spanish. So we kind of felt the same thing that I felt when I first got hired. So we ended up just kind of talking about how can we create a, a group for others to feel welcome? Because if we feel like this, there's definitely a dozen more that feel like that. So we ended up just sending like a massive email to people. And the way I did it, I was just sending emails to any any Latino last name I can think of. So I would just go to the email list and, and we had like a, an administrator um, kind of forum where we look up names and et cetera, et cetera. So I just looked up as many as I could and I just sent a massive email saying, hey, we're having lunch this day, this time at this place. And it was cool seeing that, you know, just doing that, but we didn't know what was going to happen. And then come to find out uh, over 20 plus people showed up to that lunch. And I'm like, whoa, like we have something here. And so we ended up having the support. We were telling people what we wanted to do. And I kind of just felt like, it felt like I was going for a campaign. I was shooting for like a campaign, right? So ended up doing that. And we created this diversity group at the empl our employer. And from there, like it's honestly been really positive hearing the percentage of Latinos that have grown and have applied to that place now. So uh, with that, just kind of just initiated my, my momentum of thinking about how I want to feel my community heard and how I want to amplify my community's voice. So in 2019, we did the first uh, Latino Hispanic event at that, excuse me, at the place where I was working at. And so it was cool, you know, it reached out the same thing that I'm doing right now, started reaching out to businesses, started reaching out to people within my culture who want to be part of something. And of course, you know, it's corporate, you have budget, you have these things and you kind of get limited. And, um, after that, just kind of made things happen in 2019, I still had this idea and then COVID hit. And then I had this whole thing planned out and I wanted to do more for that brand within, you know, for Latinos. But then like I said, COVID hit and then it just kind of put that project on the back burner and, um, again, you know, throughout the whole process, the five, the last five years of me having a profession in footwear design, not only was I just talking to footwear designers, but I was also just talking to different parts of that pillars of what makes an organization, you know, design, marketing, uh, retail, all these different, different, uh, skill sets and different people with different mindsets. And then just kind of just seeing how I can someday utilize those skills and apply them to something that I'm passionate for. And that brings me to say Juntos and Juntos got originated, initiated because like I said, I wanted to just amplify my community's voice. Um, one of the things that I'm not a big fan of is when a lot of, um, a lot of times Latinos get put into one specific event, one specific, uh, holiday. It's not even really a holiday, but it's Cinco de Mayo, right? So you can be from Panama, Ecuador, Puerto Rico, Cuba. It doesn't matter. Everybody just puts you in, oh, you're Latino, you belong in this place. Nah, like there's definitely much more of our culture than uh, words can even begin to describe. So ended up just uh, going that that journey. I'm like, well, how can I create something without just making people feel left out? And so uh, 2020 um, started kind of just thinking about how I wanted to do things. And 2021 came around and then started just kind of creating more of like an impact of like, okay, here's how this can happen. And then 2022, the opportunity came in. I remember I talked to somebody um, over because this event will take place in Chinatown. But I remember I talked to somebody, um, the individuals over in Chinatown, the OTCA gallery about this idea. I'm like, look, I have this idea. Um, can we make it happen? And yeah, she was like, yeah, let's do it. And she literally said, OK, you know what? Like, what are you thinking about? I said, I just want to do it for just one weekend. And the event just uh, took off from there. It went from one weekend to then her saying, you know what? How would you feel if we just gave you the gallery for a month? My jaw dropped. So I'm like, oh my gosh, like I can't say no to that. <laughs> but again, you know, throughout the last two years and a half that I've been kind of just creating this concept and project, it just helped me create something unique and authentic. So uh, to just answer your question, I know I dead into different avenues on the conversation, but Juntos is to just honestly, it's just to help my culture, Latino Hispanics, 
amplify their voice and their talent so people can actually understand and see that there's a lot of talented Latinos out in this uh, world. And so what you said too is it's going to be a five five weekend long event in, in during Hispanic Heritage Month. And then the location is going to be Chinatown. Now, are you going to close off the entire street? How, how is the event going to look? That's a great question. Uh, so logistics, right? So it's, it's so crazy how timing happens. Like um, I just uh, met with the OTCA gallery uh, manager and she mentioned that they now, uh, Chinatown has a specific plaza now where they don't even need really permits to close it. They already just have it as part of an event. So how timing things happen, I'm like, all right, cool. That means that we really don't have to apply per, for permits. Like whenever we need to use the street, then we can use it. So between, uh, in Chinatown, between 3rd and 4th and Cooch, that's the street that it's going to be closed for any sort of events. And uh, the cool thing about that is that we have the opportunity to do the event inside in the gallery and then also outside. So the five weekends it's going to be a, honestly just between the inside and the outside. So that way we have more people coming in and enjoying more of our culture. Now, these uh, weekends, is each weekend theme going to be the same or are you going to alternate different themes throughout the weekends? Alternate different themes. So every every weekend. So let me just go ahead and tell you that like every, there's going to be five weekends. So the, the event Juntos PDX is a Latino Hispanic Heritage Month Festival that it's five weekends long that will be, be about community knowledge, impact, and inspiration in celebration. So the five weekends are going to be five unique activations and five unique themes. So we're going to kick off the event with um, arte, also, you know, in English translated as art, but then art and vintage. And so how can, how can we bring different talents from different forms, not just art, but then also talented vintage collectors that have something that they can bring to the table. So it's going to be Art and Vintage um, the first weekend, which will be September 17th and 18th. And then the following weekend, uh, the 24th and the 25th, I'm excited to actually bring, this is exactly what I wanted to do at my previous employer, but I wanted to, uh, I want to bring uh, guest speakers and there will be guest speakers from different professions in the industry that are Latinos in the Portland community and beyond. So we're going to have uh, professionals from nonprofits, professionals from entrepreneurship, design, uh, uh, nursing, uh, law, and they're all going to come and talk to the audience. So in case the audience wants to dive deeper into those specific professions, they now have a name and a face they can connect with and network with to find out further more about that profession. And then the third weekend, um, and sorry, I apologize in advance. Like I, I have so many dates in my mind, but um, the third weekend, I, I believe it's October 1st and 2nd. And the third weekend will be uh, what we call Baile en la Calle, which is going to be dance and twirling in the streets. And this is where we'll be inviting, oh man, I'm excited for this one. Uh, I love to dance. So this one will include, uh, there's going to be some indigenous dancers performing. There's going to be cumbia dancers, bachata dancers, salsa, merengue dancers that are going to come in and not just perform, but also hopefully provide a workshop for the audience live. Um, and I just had a conversation with somebody um, by the name of Anna that's going to come in and actually perform some Sumba on the street, yeah, which nice. is cool because I never, never thought about that, but I'm like, yo, that's pretty fresh because it's something that it's related to our culture. Yep. And so she'll be coming in performing Zumba. There's going to be a mariachi band. There's going to be some other performers and we're also going to have some awesome DJs. Uh, we're also going to have a special guest DJ. I'm not going to share who it is because obviously it's a special guest DJ, but <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's going to be fun and it's just going to be from two to eight. All weekends will be two to eight, but I just, I can guarantee you. And, and you know, I, I want to really tell you that this is going to be a fun festival. Like just thinking about the process. I'm like, Oh my goodness. But anyways, going back to what I was saying. So that's the third weekend. And then the fourth weekend, uh, that will be October, I believe nine and eighth. Um, yeah, yep. And that's going to be a flea market out on the street. So this is going to be a flea market with uh, talented Latinos in the community that are that are great with their hands. They're great at building things. You know, there's going to be food. This place is going to be clothing vendors. There's going to be jewelry vendors. There's going to be all sorts of different creators at this flea market sharing some of their talent with the rest of the community. The goal is to connect the community with these talented folks and vice versa, these talented folks with the rest of the community because there's a lot of talent out there that just needs a little bit of shine. Yeah, uh, yep. There's so many great people out there. 
And my goal with this is just to, again, bring them to the table so that way they can uh, utilize this platform so they can share more of their talent. And the fifth weekend, which would be, you know, like anything in life, everything is temporary. Right. Nothing lasts forever. So this will be our closing ceremony and that will take place October 15th. And this will be awesome because this is where I actually want the community to have an understanding about our family oriented culture. So this will be an awesome place where families will play uh, games and such as our version of bingo, which is Loteria. It's going to be dominoes. There's going to be musical chairs and all these different awesome uh, games that families will be able to play and to win goodies. Thankfully, I was able to um, get the, I was able to get the, uh, some sponsors along the way to, that are helping with some uh, tickets. Um, I'm going to hold off on saying where from, but I just want to just let you guys know that it's going to be some, some themes locally that will be donating some tickets for families to win some of these tickets and then also to give away during the five weekends. But uh, overall, I mean, that's the pretty much the five main, um, not five main, but the five weekends. Um, and just, you know, to just make things better, it's going to be the art, music, storytelling, dance, and community gathering. Man, got a list. <laughs> got a list. So what has been difficult about trying to put all this stuff together? Oh. <laughs> Oh man, that's a great question. <laughs> As you can tell, like I'm laughing and kind of just thinking about <laughs> laugh crying. where do I start? <laughs> uh, I honestly, I think is just um, getting people to understand the passion. Uh, you can be passionate about something. You can have strong feelings towards something, but if you do not know how to sell the passion, nobody else will see it. Uh, just because you have or we have the passion doesn't mean that other people will have the same passion. So we have to speak l different languages as far as not like, um, you know, different native tongue languages. But I'm talking just like different business languages where you're able to sell the idea in a certain way. That's why I was saying at the beginning, all the skills that I learned throughout the process of my journey and my career in, forward, in the corporate of footwear, I was able to apply to the specific um, venture that I'm in right now. So... I'd say the most challenging thing has been just um, selling the idea in a way and getting people on the same page. But I can tell you, it's just I was not expecting just people's words and, you know, words of encouragement and reaching out with our uh, hand of support and saying, oh, this is awesome. Like, so hearing all these things, uh, it's been great. Uh, I can say that it started off with zero people. Now the event has 42 participants. Let's go, baby. <laughs> now, what has been easy about this process? Has there been anything easy about it? No, I wouldn't say easy. I would say everything has been challenging because this is, again, this is, has been, this is a new venture for me. I'm, I'm pretty much program coordinating. And, oh man, I, like if we talk about, I'm doing 20, well not 20, I was over exaggerating, 10 different jobs, you know, from budgeting, from marketing, from design, from uh, present, presenting and so on and so forth. So nothing has been easy, but I will tell you that I've been learning something about myself a lot. Um, you know, right now we have, my daughter here with us and one of the things that i want her to see when she gets older is that if she sets her mind into something that she's passionate for or something that she likes that you're going to face challenges but you're actually going to make it happen because it's the opportunity to show that you can prove yourself wrong and so that's where i'm at right now just uh, there's been times where you know it's i've had my head down and said you know what? i don't want to do this no more it's too much but i understand why people maybe thought about this and haven't really applied themselves because it's a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of moving pieces to this puzzle. And so I'm the only one, you know, just, I'm like a ventriloquist and just like moving 20 different, 20 different things. And, um, whatever happens, like happens, but I'm just going through the process and I'm enjoying it as much as possible. Nothing is easy. Nothing's easy. You know, one of the things you mentioned is just the difficulties of kind of going through a lot of this process by yourself, being the accountant, being the marketer, you also talked about your daughter and your sister often. Yeah. Are those, is your daughter and your sister kind of the biggest motivating factors for you to keep pushing forward? That's a great question. Like my whole family is, um, it's, oh man, like how would I say this? Like it's been, I it, honestly, my, my family, uh, sp more, more specifically my mom, cause my mom, when she migrated here, like any other migrant parent, you know, our parents bring us here for a better life or a better future and for us to grow. And so this is an opportunity to, just help my mom really 
feel proud for bringing us here like even though she already feels proud but this is an opportunity for her to just be like hey you know like that's my son he put that together but it's just to show everybody and anybody that nothing is impossible i mean there's going to be challenges that we face and i think that's those are the best those are the best things uh facing those challenges because those push you if you don't have challenges you don't learn from yourself you don't strive to do better so you have to embrace the negative moments more than the positive moments because you learn more from the negative moments than the positive moments mm. what what uh what are the things you know that keeps you up at night that you're going through this whole process that you're like man i got to get this shit done my community amplifying my community's voice uh, like i said you know going from zero people to now 42 participants and all 42 feel similar, you know, they have similar thoughts like me and I uh, just amplifying our voice. That's, that's the thing that keeps me up. But, uh, you know, honestly, not it keeps me up, but just wakes me up to keep grinding and keep doing this. Uh, and also like the reaction of the crowd. Like I'm, I'm excited to just see how the crowd just reacts. Cause <laughs> they're not going to know who I, they're not going to know who I am. They're just going to be like, Oh yeah, this is fun. I'm going to be going around asking people questions, but that's going to be, the awesome thing is just uh, having to see your your baby grow in front of your eyes, I guess, in a way. Now, what 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 can the community do to really kind of help, you know, get this thing off the ground? What can what can people do to help you? That's a great question. I've you know, I've there's so many things that I want to say about this, but <laughs> I think one of the main ones is come support. Come be part of something unique. Come be part of change. Come be part of something that mm -hmm. you are going to walk away with the sense of knowledge. Uh, the goal with this event is for everybody to walk away with knowledge. If you want to be a designer, this is your place. I'm going to connect you with designers. If you want to be a lawyer, this is going to be a great place. I'm going to connect you with lawyers. Uh, if you want to be, you know, if you want to be a tattoo artist, like this is going to be also a great place. I didn't mention, but there's, I'm, I'm working right now to getting a mm, tattoo yep. artist to come do some ink for those that want to actually get tatted up. This is the opportunity to come get tatted up. Nothing too crazy, small lettering, small art. But it's just the opportunity to show these talented folks, bring them to the table and so people can network, but network in a fun and authentic way. Yep. In fact, we're we're collaborating and we're trying to work together to carry uh, an unveiling or the last unveiling, actually, of a traveling art exhibit that's really going to be displaying all of these different storytellers, um, innovators and entrepreneurs here in the Oregon area, all the Latinos throughout the Hispanic Heritage Month. And the goal is really, again, to amplify what the community has done, uh, not just individually, but as a, as a state, right? And in addition to that, in fact, you know, one little call out for those that might be interested, because this is going to air before that, there is a Latino networking event at the Hillsborough Hop Stadium on Labor Day weekends for those individuals. Please reach out to me. I'm happy to give you some more information on that. But with that said... What give some give give the listeners at home some advice? What what's some advice you can give some of the listeners that might be thinking of of starting an event like this, trying to get involved in the community? What advice would you have for them? That's a good question. Be passionate. Your passion will guide the process because if you are hungry for it, it's going to drive everything else for you. Like you don't even have to really try it. Things will just come at you a certain way. And it's going to make you feel uncomfortable. And that's when you feel uncomfortable, that's when you know you're doing something good. Because <laughs> yeah. you're like, all right, cool. Like I've, I felt uncomfortable so many times throughout this process. But I would say if you're passionate and if you are hungry to make something happen, not just for yourself, but for your community or your family, whoever, if you're passionate for it and if you put your mind into it, it's so crazy to say that the process will just honestly start igniting itself and it start building this energy that you just can't even imagine. So my advice to you is that have passion and let that passion breathe. But at the same time, share some of those thoughts with other people so you can hear some feedback. Not, I'm not saying go around asking everybody for feedback, but ask your close friends, your, your people, your, your, your homies, your energy around you. Ask what they think about this. Because at the end of the day, their feedback will help you guide the process. Like if I may say this, like it's so crazy. I want to give a shout out to my, uh, one, of my, one of my good friends uh, named Joel, Joel Cauley. I've known this guy for so long and it's so crazy because if I show you the presentation, <laughs> if I show you the first presentation, it's trash. Like <laughs> I look at it and I'm like, man, I don't even want to be part of oh, this. Oh yeah. Event. Those first presentations are always <laughs> the best. But he, he helped me a lot. He just a smaller advice because he has industry also in the corporate world of footwear, but him presenting ideas and so on and so forth and him giving me thoughts and, 
and some pointers like you know some of those pointers were hardish like hey but be honest with me and I took that and just applied it to my presentation. I haven't even shown him the presentation. He actually just sent me a message yesterday like, hey, how is the event doing? I'm like, oh, it's it's going good. And I mentioned some things. He's like, oh, he's like, all right, cool. It looks like uh, you're doing great. So if you need any help, <laughs> let me know. I'm like, bro, you helped a lot. <laughs> but that's my advice, honestly. Just uh, be passionate and let the passion uh, breathe and let the passion speak. Nice. Now, for the folks at home that might be interested in connecting with you, maybe talking about shoes, maybe getting involved in this event. How do they find out more about Juntos? How do they find out more about you? Yeah, so uh, there's different platforms, different uh, avenues and pillars, but you can go to juntospdx.net. And again, that's J-U-N-T-O-S-P-D-X.net. And that's where you'll be able to see what this event will be about when it will take place. Uh, another platform where you can get in touch with me is uh, LinkedIn as well, uh, Christian Vargas. You can also get in touch with me on Instagram, uh, CM underscore Vargas. And you can also, again, just get in touch with me through JuntosPDX.net. Um, but honestly, I would love to hear some of you guys' thoughts about this podcast. This has been uh, honestly energetic. Like I just really, I don't even want to leave. Like I want to continue talking. <laughs> We'll keep to you talking after this. Don't worry, because I got some things to talk to you about shoes okay. anyways. All right, folks. Thank you so much for listening at home. For those that are interested, please follow me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn at The Shades of E. You can also visit us at theshadesofe.com. And please do sign up for that newsletter. Have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.